like the one who serves. For who is the greatest? The one who is at the table or the one who serves? It is not the one who is at the table. But I am among you as one who serves. You are those who have stood by me in my trials. And I conjure on your, you a kingdom, just as my Father conferred one on me, so that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom, and sit on thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Sometimes we get things backwards. <clears throat> there was a man out in Texas. He had a tradition to always put up on his roof the words Noel, N-O-E-L, -E at Christmas time. Big letters cut out of plywood, laid it against the slanted roof, and then put lights around it. When they plugged in the lights, you could see them for a long distance. Noel celebrating Christmas. His wife kept telling him, it's getting close to Christmas. You better get those signs up there on the roof. But he was slow. Put it off. Finally, his wife told him again and again. He said, okay, I've got to get it done. I'll do it today. Well, the day went by. Got toward evening. It started getting dark. The wind came up. Started blowing. He said, I told her I'd do it. i got to do it because Christmas is coming. So he got up on the roof and he, the wind was blowing. He's holding those big plywood letters trying to get them straight and everything. Finally, he got them up there. It was dark by now. He crawled down from the roof, told his kids, plug it in. Let's see what it looks like. And when they plugged it in, it spelled Leon. L-E-O-N. He got the letters back. You know, sometimes we get things backwards. Sometimes we get things backwards. Sometimes we're dull and asleep. You remember Jesus went in the Garden of Gethsemane and prayed earnestly, but the disciples slept. And he said to them when he woke them up, watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. And about that time Judas came and they arrested Jesus and led him away to crucify him. And you know what happened to the disciples at the cross? They all fled pursuing him. They should have been praying instead of sleeping. They had things backwards. Didn't they? The story's told that a bus driver and a preacher died and stood before Peter at the Golden Gate to the heavenly world. And the bus driver came before Peter and he said, uh, there's your mansion over there on the hilltop. Beautiful mansion. Preacher thought, well, if the bus driver gets the mansion, I'm a preacher. I've I, I preached to hundreds of people. I've told the love of Jesus far and wide. I've baptized lots. What am I going to get? So he comes before Peter. And Peter points down in the valley and says, there's your shack down in the valley. The preacher says, what? The bus driver gets the mansion and I get the shack? What's going on here? Peter explained it this way. He said, well, when you preached, people slept. But when he drove, people prayed. <laughs> Sometimes we get it backwards. We get it backwards. We get the wrong thought in our mind. The contribution was being passed one time in church, and mom put in some bills, and when the plate came in front of little Johnny, he grabbed in there and pulled out a dollar bill and said, Whoopee, mom, now we can go get ice cream. <laughs> you had it backwards, didn't you? <laughs> It's not get, it's give. 
And the whole philosophy of the world is different. Greece said, be wise, know yourself. Rome said, be strong, discipline yourself. Epicureanism said, be sensuous, enjoy yourself. Psychology says, be confident, assert yourself. Materialism says, be satisfied, please yourself. Pride says, be superior, promote yourself. Humanism says, be capable, believe in yourself. But Jesus says, be a servant, give yourself. You know, the gospel begins with the word give. For God so loved the world that He, say it, gave. 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 He gave. And the Bible says, I did not come into the world to be served, but to serve and to give my life as a ransom for me. So here the disciples are now at the Last Supper. We've read it. Last week, week before, we read a follow-up story today. Luke chapter 22. They're sitting there. In just a few hours, Jesus will be on the cross. This is your final discourse, his final words <laughs> to his disciples. So, as they're talking, he, uh, he takes bread. He says, this is my body. This is for you. They eat something, and then after supper, he takes the cup, and he says, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then Jesus says, the hand of him who is going to betray me is on the table. And they start looking around. Is it I? Is it I? Is it I? The Bible says they ask that question. And then the Bible says, strangely, here in Luke chapter 22, at this occasion, a dispute arose among them as to which of them was considered to be the greatest. Now wait a minute. Jesus is talking about his death. He's breaking bread in remembrance of his coming death. He's telling me to drink the fruit of the vine in remembrance of his blood of the covenant given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And they start arguing who's number one and who's number two. Who's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Right at the communion table. It'd be like us having a fuss right now. We just had communion. And then we get in a big fuss right here in the church. And they started to argue. Well, who's the best? Who's the greatest? You know, we like to be number one. We like to be the best. Who's the best tennis player in the world? Who's the best football player in the world? Who's the best singer in the world? Who's number one? We even make a list of the top ten of everything. We want to be at the top. And so these disciples right here at the Last Supper are arguing about who's number one. Can you believe it? Jesus just been talking about his death for them. And they're arguing about which one of us is the greatest. What did Jesus do? He looked at him and said, Don't you know anything? Weren't you listening? What's wrong with you? Didn't do that at all. He still loved them. He had to put up with them. He was patient and kind with them. And he taught them a lesson about the kings of this earth. They're, they're out for power and glory and status, but you're not that way. And I'm among you as one who serves, and that's what you're to be, servants. He still was trying to teach them and break through the hardness of their heart and the stupidity of their minds. But that's not the first time they had that argument. No. He had worked with them for three years. And they had hard arguments several times. When I go back in the Bible and the Gospels, I, I trace it. And I'm going to the Gospel of Mark to trace it. And when I go to the 8th chapter of Mark, 
The Bible says in verse 31, He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that He must be killed and after three days rise again. So He's talking about His death that's coming. But look what happened. He spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Oh, Lord, this won't ever happen to you. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get thee behind me, Satan. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Then Jesus talked about the way of the cross. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Well, whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me in the gospel will save it. Then he goes on to say in chapter 9, verse 1, Truly I tell you, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the kingdom of God has come with power. The next story in Mark 9 is a transfiguration where Jesus took Peter, James, and John to a mountain and he was transfigured before them as he talked with Moses and Elijah about his exodus, his going out of the world. As we continue flipping the pages, we come to chapter 9, verse 30. They left that place and passed through Galilee. Jesus did not want anyone to know that he was who they were, where they were, because he was teaching the disciples. He said to them, The Son of Man is going to be delivered in the hands of men. They will kill him, and after three days he will rise. But they did not understand what he meant and were afraid to ask him. Second time, Jesus has told them that he's going to die. But notice the next verse, chapter 9, 33. They came to Capernaum. When he was in the house, he asked them, What were you arguing about there on the road? Now Jesus knew. But he asked a question so to bring it to their mind. They kept quiet because on the way they argued about who was the greatest. All right, here's 12 disciples. They're jockeying for position. Who's number one? Who's number two? Sitting down, Jesus called the 12 and said, Anyone who wants to be first must be very last and servant of all. He took a little child and he placed among them, taking the child in his arms. He said to them, Whoever welcomes one of these little children in my name welcomes me. Whoever welcomes me does not welcome me only, but the one who sent. He teaches us about servanthood of destiny. Then in chapter 10, verse 32, Jesus predicts his death a third time. They were on the way up to Jerusalem, and Jesus leading the way, and the disciples were astonished, while those who followed were afraid. Again, he took the twelve aside and told them what was going to happen to him. We're going up to Jerusalem. And the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and to the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles who will mock him, spit on him, flog him, and kill him. Three days later, he will rise. Now what do you think the next thing is going to be in the Bible? The next story. Next verse. Oh, it's going to be, all oh, the disciples were so sad. Lord, this will never happen to you. Lord, we're so sorry to hear this. What can we do, Lord? How can we help you? Oh, that's not it. Read the next verse. The very next verse. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him. Now James and John were up there on that mountain with Peter and Jesus. Remember? Mount Transfiguration. They saw Jesus glorified. And Jesus talked about his death. Teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. Wow. You're talking about a blank check. You know, people come to me sometimes and say, Calvin, I want to ask you a favor. Will you do it? Wait a minute. What is the favor? You know, I always like to know, well, what am I sticking my neck into? And Jesus did the same thing. He was pretty wise. He said, well, what do you want me to do for you? You know, before he says, yes, I'll do it. He said, well, what do you want? The Bible says, they replied, let one of us sit at your right hand and the other at your left in your glory. They're doing it again. They just did it over in chapter 8. Now here it is chapter 10. They're saying it again. Two of them come. Now they'd seen Jesus transfigured. They'd heard about the kingdom. They'd heard about that they would sit on thrones judging the tribes of Israel. They heard about power and glory and status and prestige. And they said, now 
We want to be Secretary of the Treasury and we want to be Secretary of Defense in your kingdom. They thought it was a political earthly kingdom. And they're going to have power like Caesar has power and kings have power and presidents have power. They didn't understand the kingdom. And Jesus said, you don't know what you're asking. Can you drink the cup I drink and be baptized with the baptism I'm baptized with? He's talking about his suffering here. Baptized in suffering. Baptized in immersed in death it's going to be. Drink the bitter cup of wrath, of, of punishment for sins. And they said, we can! Boy, yeah, we can do it! They don't know what they're saying. I find it very interesting that James and John were the ones who asked this. James was the first disciple, the first apostle to die. Fourteen years later, Herod, in Acts 12, cut off his head. First apostle. He said, we can drink it. Well, he had to drink it. John is there, his brother. John's the last apostle to die. He spent imprisonment on Patmos and other persecution for the cause of Christ. And he lived to be high into his 90s. He didn't die until, until about 60 years after his brother. But both of them suffered. And Jesus said, you will drink the cup I drink and be baptized with the baptism I'm baptized with, but to sit at my right or left hand is not for me to grant. Those places belong to those for whom they've been prepared. It's all right to want ambition. It's all right to want to be great. But you've got to have the right definition of greatness. God gives it to you. You don't ask for it. And the way you get it he says, as he continues, when the ten heard about this, they were indignant with James and John. Why do you think the ten other disciples were angry at James and John? Why? Because they beat them to the punch. They, James and John, were afraid that Peter, who's always leading, would ace them out. And so when the other disciples heard that James and John got there first, and ask for number one and number two. They were saying, well, we were going to ask you, but you beat us to it. It's kind of like, you know, when you were a child. Went out of recess in school. You're going to play for 30, 40 minutes. Some kid says, first batter! And everybody has to fall in behind that, you know. Or you get in your car, you want to drive somewhere. Somebody says, Shotgun! It means I want to ride out in front. You guys get in the back. They called it first. Whoever calls it first gets it. And so the other disciples are angry because James and John have called it first. They're indignant. You're making us number two to number two to thirteen or three to thirteen, and now we don't like that. We want to be first. And Jesus said. You know, among the Gentiles, they lord it over them. Their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. Whoever wants to be first among you must be slave. For the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give His life as a ransom for many. Jesus said, you want to be like me? You want to follow my steps? You're going to die. And the way to greatness... <laughs> is through service. You want to be great? Then serve. Now let me ask you, are you like Peter and John? Are you like them? I want to confess, I'm like them. <laughs> Pride is the thing that I have to battle against the most. Pride. I want to be my own God. Or I want to be in control. Or I want to be in charge. Or I want to be number one. You know, I've been preaching 50 years. And when I get the lectureship program from Harding University or Free Harding University or Abilene Christian University, I went to all those schools. I know all those people. And I look at those people and they're 28-year-old boys preaching. And here I'm 74 years old. They didn't ask me. <clears throat> Why? Man, I've been preaching 40 years when those guys were born. Why didn't they ask me? I'm like Peter and John. Yeah. I am. 
I'm like John, James and John. Lord, I size up other people in terms of what they can do for me. How they can further my program, feed my ego, satisfy my needs, give me strategic advantage. I exploit people ostensibly for your sake, but really for my own. Lord, I turn to you to get the inside track, obtain special favors, your direction for my schemes, your power for my projects, your sanction for my ambitions, your blank check for whatever I want. I am like James and John. We're all like it. Because we all want to be our own God. I've been to churches where this goes on. I've been to churches where somebody's name gets mentioned in the church bulletin. Maybe it's their birthday or their anniversary or congratulations for an award or, or maybe it's because they're sick. Their name is there. <clears throat> Somebody says, well, you didn't put my name in there. I had a birthday too, you know. I've been in churches where a certain elder or a certain leader got to lead the singing or give the communion message. Can you believe it? Give the communion message? And somebody else will say, well, he's done it three times this month and I haven't even done it once. I've been to church dinners. And I'll look at some lady's peach gobbler and I'll say, Sister, mm, that's the best peach gobbler I've ever had. Somebody goes, mm. Well, I brought it last month and you didn't say anything about mine. <laughs> like Peter and John. What is the way to greatness in the kingdom? You see, the world believes in a, a pyramid. You climb to the top. The apex is up there. You work your way up till you get to be number one. That's the way you go to business, isn't it? You work for a company and say, well, what do you do? Well, I'm a manager. Ah, see, then we will start turning your head and you want to know how important is this guy? How big a manager is he? So you say, well, how many people work for you? Wow! You mean you supervise and you're the boss over 50 people? Yeah. Wow, you must be important. Then you go to another brother in the same church and you say, What do you do? Well, I'm a manager. What's the next question? How many people work for you? 500! Wow, you're really something. See, that's the way we think, isn't it? So what do we think? We climb our way to the top. Whoever's got the most people under them is the greatest. You know what Jesus does? You see this pyramid? Turns it upside down. He says, work your way to the bottom. It's not how many people serve you, it's how many people do you serve. That's what he said. And how many did Jesus serve? He served us all. So if you want to argue at the Lord's table, don't argue about who's the greatest. Argue about how can I help somebody? How can I do good for you? How can I meet your needs? All right, I want you to do something with me right now. In your mind right now, everybody's different, so you do a different thing, but you do it for me. Because I'm going to illustrate for me. I'm not going to ask you who it is. You just do it in your mind. Who is the greatest Christian that you've ever met? Now just think about it. It could be a man or a woman. I didn't say a church leader necessarily. I said the greatest Christian. Who's the greatest Christian that you've ever known? Now, I'm going to guess who it is. It's the person who came to see you when you were in the hospital. It's the brother who came over and mowed your yard because you were out of commission. It's the person who took your children to school, who washed your dishes, who mopped your floor, who cleaned your house when you were sick in the bed. It's the person that you called at 2 o'clock in the morning because you were depressed and tired of life and the world was crashing in. You thought about ending it all. 
It's the person who cared enough to ask you about how you were doing and then stayed around to listen to your answer. It's the person who always warmly welcomed you and greeted you with love and kindness. It's the person who called you when you weren't there for three weeks. It's the person who teaches the little children back in the children's program. It's the person who took the time to come to your house and teach you about Jesus. It's the person that went on the weekend retreat, the camping trip, and drove the bus or cooked the food and did the cleanup while you were having a big time playing and having fun. It's the sister that brought a hot apple pie over and some chicken soup when you were too sick to cook. It's the person who gave you money to buy groceries for the week when you lost your job. I got it, then. It's the person who served you the most. It's not the best preacher. You know, I was preaching five, six years down in Houston. At this church, and I visit the hospitals, and that's a big chore when you're in Houston because it could be 30 miles to the hospital. And parking is a problem. And getting there to the room that's got 15 stories high in the building, and getting through traffic, and you could take half a day going to the hospital. <coughs> so Vicki Slaughter came out and she said, Calvin, I'm going to the hospital and having heart surgery. I said, Vicki, I'll come see you. Oh, you don't need to come. I'll be there. So I went to the hospital. She said, I see you. Never said, just two minutes, please. So, so I go in, and there she is on the bed, kind of weak. Take her by the hand. I said, Vicki, God loves you, and so do I. I said, the Lord has promised to never leave you or forsake you. He's with you. And he said that his grace is sufficient for you. He's going to take you. Let me pray for him. Lord, bless me. Help her to recover. Bless Al, her husband. Thank you for her life, Lord. Give her strength. In Jesus' name, amen. I walked out of the room. That was it. Two minutes. I stayed at that church for five years. My last Sunday, my last sermon, the last day, I'm moving on. And everybody comes by and hugs you and kisses you. Vicki came by. She said, Calvin, literally, here's what she said. I don't remember any sermon you ever preached. But I'll never forget when you came to see me in the hospital. Who is the greatest? It's the one who served you the most. That's what Jesus said. And it's it? It true, isn't it? That's the greatest. I want to be like Martin Luther King. I want to be like Martin Luther King in what he said about his funeral. He talked about what kind of funeral he's going to have. So here's what he said. As he was preaching about death one. One of his sermons, it's in his book. You can find the book and read it. He said, if any of you are around when I have to meet my day, I don't want a long funeral. And if you get somebody to deliver the eulogy, tell them not to talk too long. Every now and then I wonder what I want them to say. Tell them not to mention that I have a Nobel Peace Prize that's not important. Tell them not to mention that I have three or four hundred other awards. That's not important. Tell them not to mention where I went to school or how many degrees I have. That's not important. I'd like for somebody to mention that day that Martin Luther King tried to give his life to serving God. I'd like for somebody to say that day that Martin Luther King tried to love somebody. 
I want you to say that day that I tried to be right on the war question. I want you to be able to say that day that I did try to feed the hungry. I want you to be able to say that day that I did in my life clothe those who were naked. I want you to say on that day that I did try in my life to visit those in prison. I want you to say that I tried to love and serve humanity. Yes, if you want to say that I was a drum major, say that I was a drum major for justice. Say that I was a drum major for peace. I was a drum major for righteousness. And all of the other shallow things will not matter. I won't have any money to leave behind. I won't have the fine and luxurious things of life to leave behind. I just want to leave a committed life behind. And that's all I want to say. If I can help somebody as I pass along, if I can cheer somebody with a word or song, if I can show somebody he's traveling wrong, then my living will not be in vain. If I can do my duty as a Christian ought, if I can bring salvation to a world overwrought, if I can spread the message as the Master taught, then my living will not be in vain. The greatest among you shall be certain of the rest. So how can you serve? Who can you serve? How can you serve? Open your eyes. Look. And when you see a need, fill it. When you see a broken heart, heal it. When you see a soul that's searching for God, teach him. If I can help somebody all along life's way, then my living will not be in vain. Make me a servant, Lord. Make me a servant. Make me like you. Let's sing.